So, hello, Kendall girls. Thank you for joining us for the Share Africa interviews. You are an artist, a painter engaged in the diffusion of the African arts and culture. Could you please introduce yourself to our public? Where were you born and when? Tell us a little about your inspiring story. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to speak with you. Um, you know, the question about where I was born is interesting because I guess I've had more than one birth. Um, and it also raises the question of naming. Um, so biologically, I was born in South Africa in 1967. And at some point in my life, um, I became aware of the crime against humanity that I'd been born into. And by the age of 15, I ran away from home and then set about a process of trying to give birth to myself, um, which would be, let's say, a non-biological birth in which one creates one's own identity, um, in which one creates one's own um, destiny by engaging with this process of who I am, what do I stand for, what do I believe in. So instead of inheriting a birth and a circumstance beyond my control, it's about taking responsibility for that act of being born. So yeah, I grew up in South Africa during apartheid um, and lived there all my life until um, 1980, 1989, in which case I was sent into involuntary exile um, because of my political activities in the struggle against apartheid and went to London as a refugee um, and I always like to um, make the point that um, I had at that time blonde hair, and blue eyes, and refugees can come in any number of shapes, colors, genders, and forms. And I was a blonde hair, blue eyed, um, anti apartheid activist ending up in London as a refugee. Um, I then ended up in New York for, for a year as an illegal alien and went back to South Africa when Mandela was released at the beginning of 1990. And that in a way was me giving birth to myself again. Um, that was a, an idea of going back to South Africa to, to, to participate in this new country, to participate in this new democracy, to be active in the, the process of literally um, giving birth to myself at the same time as seeing a country being born. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Share Africa is an initiative that aims to inspire the youth of the African continent. For all the young people who have a calling as artists, mm -hmm. tell us how you came to painting as a young man. Excuse me. So, I mean, the, the journey of becoming an artist was a fascinating one. Um, and it raises questions about um, destiny. It raises questions about education. It raises many kinds of questions. Um, because um, I'm atypical from the most white South African people that one might encounter in the sense that I was born into a working class Afrikaans family. It was not the, um, the, 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 the normative um, white person that one would generally tend to, to meet. Um, and that working class circumstance um, created, um, had, its, has, had its resonance and had its, its effect on, on my life in the sense that um, my destiny had been to fall between the, between the cracks, uh, between the seams um, of an education and a socio-political system. And um, so I had a, a very terrible education. Um, I remember not studying art at all. And my dreams, my aspiration as a young boy was to uh, put as much distance between where I was coming from um, and where I, was, where I would like to go to, because um, at some point when, I and then I guess we'll speak to that a bit later, um, at some point when I started to understand the circumstances of my birth, um, I just wanted to run away I, uh, as far as possible, um, put distance between my cultural, um, and, and family heritage and, and, and the, this, this new person that I would become. And my dream had always been to study mathematics and science. And I was very good at mathematics. 
um, actually one of the top students in the country. Um, and um, because I believed I wanted to study nuclear, we call it nuclear engineering, uh, which is quantum physics today, um, because I, I like the abstraction of the, of the mathematics, the abstraction of the laws of nature, the abstraction of how we would um, create rules for, for what we call reality. And what the, the, the nature of apartheid, the, the backbone of apartheid, the structure and system was the military. And every white man from the age of 16 had to go into the military for two years. And not going to the military, you'd be sent into a civilian jail for six years. And the reason why I stress civilian jail is that, um, you know, the, the, the general mindset of the country was that you go to the army to become a man. So if you don't go to the army, you're not a man. So six years in civilian jail was really, was really um, extremely violent. Um, I had some friends who chose that path and they were psychologically um, damaged and never really recovered. Um, so I chose the path of saying, I'm not going to go to the army. I absolutely refuse to participate in this, in this fascism. And the only way to not go to the army was to continue studying. So when you are 16, that's fairly easy. You just get a letter from the school to say you, you're still at school. And, you know, you, six months later, you get the, the, the call up papers again. Um, but at some point I was running out of options because I was matriculating. And in my final year at school, um, I decided I was going to study, um, you know, science, um, moving towards a, a specialization in, in nuclear nuclear and nuclear physics. Um, and I filled in the form for Witts University, which was the, 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 the better option in Johannesburg, the main university in, in, in Johannesburg. And my application was for, for science, Bachelor of Science. And the application said that you have to put a second choice. Um, if you didn't put a second choice, then the first choice would be null and void. And I found that in my very young mind to be oppressive and unreasonable because I was so clear as to what I wanted to study that the idea of putting a second choice was, was preposterous. So I went through the list of everything that you could study at the university. And I was thinking, if you're gonna force me to give a second choice, I'm gonna make a joke of your choice. So I went in search on the list of the most ridiculous, preposterous, stupid, non-existing joke of anything you could possibly study. And I came across fine arts. I was like, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. I'm gonna put that as a joke to provoke you. <laughs> so I fell in my second choice, Bachelor of Arts in Fine Arts. Um, the, 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 the applications are sent off and I get accepted to both. And for the very first time in my life, I pose the question, oh, well, what is art? Just out of pure curiosity, I've accepted, been accepted to this degree. Um, what is it? What, what is art? Um, and at this point, I honestly would not have been able to tell the difference between Leonardo da Vinci and Picasso. Um, I probably would have recognized the Mona Lisa, but I surely would not have known who painted the Mona Lisa. And so I went off at the, it was the end of the school year, the end of the academic year. And I went to join the art class to find out what is art. So I sneaked into the classroom and there was um, only two students at the front of the class um, still trying to listen. The rest were at the back having fun. It was the last week, so they didn't really care. And the teacher had also decided on this particular day to step outside the curriculum. It was the end of the year. And the teacher said that she would like to, for herself, for her own pleasure, entertainment, education, she was going to teach a course on Dada. And so I sat there in the front of the class, very curious, what is art? And the teacher <laughs> began to explain that during the First World War, there were these artists who retreated to the neutral country of Switzerland. And they went there and they said that if mustard gas, trench warfare, barbed wire, and all the atrocities of the First World War were the result of the logical, rational brain, they would do the irrational, illogical opposite. And it was exactly what I needed to hear at that moment in time, because all of a sudden, um, my brain, you know, suddenly became electrified. And, and I suddenly said, but if that's what art is, and if I'm going to study at university to not go to the military, 
then it makes sense that I'm going to study art. It was, you know, and it was it just somehow a provocation to myself. It was something which, you know, it was, and, but in retrospect, what I can say, it was a calling. Art really called me and, you know, and it, and, and, and it was in that moment that um, I took a very radical, extreme decision in my life to do something I felt ill-qualified to do, ill-equipped, to study something I had no idea what it was and threw myself into the deep end, learning how to create art. And here I am um, 50, at 54 years old, still an artist. And I understand today um, the power of art to transform, the power of art to change the world. Um, and the thing that I, you, you ask what advice or how would I speak to young people in Africa? Well, it's, it's, it's this, and that is um, what makes Africa especially interesting is that the, the relationship between life and culture is very close. The sense of the, the, that the, the, the value and the meaning of the things that we make still has a very close proximity. Art is still very much part of our lives. It still has a, a symbolic function, which is powerful um, because it hasn't been um, swallowed up by market demand, swallowed up by galleries, which, which, which are um, taking over the, 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 the creativity and turning it into, into productions um, and something to consume. The power of art is that it's not about the things we make. It's about the things that we embody. And that's the great thing about African art. It's about embodiment. And the things that we embody are about how to take these symbolic, could be words, could be sounds, could be objects, could be images, could be signs, um, and, and transform them because our craft of artists is to change the world by changing perception. The world is constructed by perception. How we see the world is determined by our faith. And that perception will determine what you're going to see. Um, and the power of art is we can shift that. We can shift the way things are. So for me as a very young man, um, uh, uh, the, my perception changed about what art could be when I understood that, that these people called the Dadaists in Zurich could have had such a powerful effect on my life, um, you know, half a century later that I decided to literally change the course of my own destiny. Well, what, what a very... <laughs> Well, um, passioning story and passionate story. Um, so I would say maybe if I understood well what you said, uh, so art could be the first time you were reborn in some way. And as you already told us, uh, well, you rebirth was an important part of your personal construction and the uh, way you uh, personally grew as, uh, as an artist, as a person, as an activist. Um, I would like to ask you a question about the date of birth you, cho you chose. Uh, so you chose May 1968. Um, it seems to be very important in the way you built your artistic identity, as we have um, discussed. Um, it's a period that is famous for the riots, the rebellions and the claims uh, from the youth, especially so we are a French association. So in France, uh, especially May 1968 was um, the moment of all the students claims. Um, what is the event, the one event in this year, 1968, that has the most inspired you? Okay, so this is, you know, this is a very good example of um, the power of art because we, I mean, the, the events of May 68 were very important indeed. I chose that date for a number of reasons. Um, the, the, what happened in Paris, certainly per, perhaps the most obvious and important, but it's also important to remind ourselves that it wasn't only in Paris, it was also in Brussels, it was in Prague, it was in Mexico. Um, it was all over the world. And it was also in May 68 that there were protests at the Venice Biennale at the participation of the South African artists. And that was the last time that South Africa participated in the Venice Biennale until 1993. Um, so it's also the beginning of the cultural boycott. It's the beginning of an, an era into which I'm born. But the most significant thing about May 68 is that whilst it was a utopian socio-political um, challenge, revolution, protest, manifestation, it was also very much led by the artists. 
Um, and, you know, a lot of the posters that we understand of the May 68 protests were made at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. Um, and the, one of the, the, the gurus, one of the, the founding um, figures of, the, of the, the philosophy of May 68 was Guy Debord. Um, and he was an artist. So this is also very important to understand how closely linked the, the, the events of May 68 were connected to art. Um, and Guy Debord's idea of the society of the spectacle um, and challenging um, the, 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 the capitalistic um, modus operandi of, of the European and, and in particular France um, at that particular time. And one of the things that I was extremely influenced by in terms of Guy Debord is his idea of a detournement. The, the, where the and the, the theory of detournement is that it's literally he quoted as any sign can be turned into anything else, even its opposite. So the the, the beauty of of detournement and the, the the philosophy of the Situationist International and the the ideas behind the basic state rights is that you could take something a simple sign, and that sign can be completely transformed from. A, a point of, of, of incarceration to a point of liberation. It can be transformed from a sign of, um, of um, submission into a sign of, of um, destruction. And I give a very good example. Um, perhaps the most, one of the most iconic images from May 68 is the, the poster that says, uh, beauty is in the, beauty is in the, beauty dans la rue. Um, and you see somebody throwing a brick um, and that was also turned into a poster, the idea of throwing the brick um, as a form of protest. Now, the brick became a very important part of my language because a brick is a very simple clay object. Um, and I like to work with red clay because um, according to the, the mythological idea of the Bible, we're all created out of red clay. Um, even, even, the, even the Greek stories of, of Prometheus speak about us being created out of clay. So the red brick is a very simple object that you can use to build a house. You can use it to build a wall. You can use it to make a work of art like Carl Andre. You can use it also to throw at the police and it becomes then a symbol of liberation. Now the same brick in the gallery or the same brick in the street has two very different meanings, two very different functions. One can be aesthetic, the other then becomes ethic. And that became you know, one of the, the guiding principles in the reasons why I chose May 68, because it's hard to shift from aesthetics into ethics. You know, um, you know there was a, the very famous um, French book um, about uh, Nicolas Borio about relational aesthetics. And when he invited me to be part of that project, I, I refused because I said, my work is not about relational aesthetics. My, my work is about re relational ethics. And the reason why I make that, that point is because my life is infused with politics because life is about human relations, which are coded in terms of hierarchies and power relations. And how does one negotiate those power relations? How do you take a generic brick, which is absolutely uninteresting in its own, in, in itself, and shift that brick into a symbol of protest or a symbol of, of building a home? Um, you know, be also, you know, in South Africa, you know, one can't take for granted that one has a home. You know, a lot of shanty towns are built um, with, with makeshift pieces of wood or plastic or corrugated iron, um, makeshift materials because one, they don't have access to the brick. So one can't take that for, um, for granted. So such a simple thing as a brick. And, you know, the May 68 um, movement moment um, seemed to me the perfect place to locate my birth because in choosing who I, how I'm going to be born, who I'm going to become, that moment in history fixes time in terms of um, revolutionary aesthetics, fixes time in terms of utopian um, desires to, to make the world a better place. Um, and perhaps I should also explain um, why I wanted to transform. Because so in the same way as the brick can be shifted from an aesthetic into an ethical object, so too I, want, I needed to shift my identity. Because when I came back from New York, 
Um, I arrived back in South Africa just before Mandela was released. Um, and the, the very important, complicated, vital challenge was, what do I believe in? Because for most people in the world, you will be able to think about your education, your heritage, your ancestors, your family. Um, you, have a, you have a parachute, a cultural, political, religious, social parachute that will protect your fall into life. Um, and you can rely on certain unknowns. Um, you can rely on certain unspoken truths because you're protected by your cultural heritage. Now, when I arrived back in South Africa in 1990, I had the problem of every single thing I'd been taught by my father, by my church, by my school, by my government, by, every, by, my, by the police, by the magistrate, every single thing that I had been taught was good, was in fact a crime against humanity. And my very identity as a white male South African Afrikaans person was a crime against humanity. I had been born into the, the, into something that I could not accept. I was bred to become something that was unacceptable. And so I had to give birth to myself. I had to literally start again and give birth to myself to speak a new language, create a new identity, create a new vision of what I might be. Um, and I did that in a work with a work of art that I call Bloody Hell. And what I did was I took the blood out of my arm and I washed myself in my own blood. So this is a, it was a ritual process of giving birth to myself. But it's not only my blood, it's the blood of my ancestors. And the thing about blood is that the more you wash, the more dirty you become. The cultural, political inheritance of my ancestors is inescapable. Could I ever cleanse myself of my history? Could I ever become, can I ever become um, more than my own destiny? Can I ever escape the history of, of the circumstances of my birth? And the only way I can do that is to create a new language, which is the language of art. And so, you know, that's this idea of Guy de Bord, his idea of Ditonama was a way for me to take the sign of myself and transform me into its opposite. Thank you, Kendall. <laughs> As you just mentioned, in uh, 1919, after Nelson Mandela and other political prisoners were released from prison, you finally returned in South Africa. Uh, did you ever consider staying in the United States to practice your art? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's uh, as, as uh, it, was, it was also very funny. I mean, I would go to uh, um, a bank in the United States and uh, the cashier was an African-American and she saw my United Nations refugee passport and she said, oh, you're from South Africa? I said, yes. And she refused to cash my check um, because I was a white South African. Um, now, I, I perfectly understand that. Um, and that's, that's the, you know, what I call the perversity of my birth or the, or the birth of my perversity. This is something one carries around forever. Um, and as difficult as it might be to be a South African, at the same time, my heart is in Africa. My, it's, my, it's my roots, it's my, it's my identity. I'm deeply rooted in the, in the South African soil. Um, so at that point, it was inconceivable for me to, to not go back. Um, and it's also inconceivable because I had been part of the the protest movement. I've been part of the anti-apartheid movement. So the fact that we won, the fact that Mandela was going to be released, the fact that apartheid was over, was a time to go back and try to make a change, make a difference, um, participate in the new democracy. Um, and it was, you know, those years from 1990 through to 97 were the most extraordinary years I ever lived. To see the changes, the shifts, the, 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 the birth pains of a country coming into being um, and uh, I, I, I would not give anything to, to, um, to have changed um, the, 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 the opportunity of being there at that time. Okay. And when you were very young, you were also part of a group, KUS, a music group with whom you shared a lot at that early stage of your creative life. Uh, 
Yes. How does this experience impact your literary work, especially as an artist? Well, you see, it goes back to what I said a little bit earlier. Um, you know, the we tend to live in a time where we want to specialize and over specialize. And so you have to be either a painter or a sculptor. You can't even be an artist in general. When we really get compartmentalized into, into our worlds of high extreme specialization. And in that process of extreme specialization, we lose the bigger picture. We lose sight of um, yeah, the, 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 the broader sense of community and um, and, you know, there's this wonderful philosophy in South Africa, Ubuntu, which is that you are because of other people. And this was always very important for me. And so I never felt ever the need to restrict my creativity to any one medium or one form or even one discipline, um, because it was important that I express myself in different ways. And very often my my decisions are based on circumstance or sense of emergency. So in the last days of apartheid, really it was uh, in 1988-89, um, when I was still at art school, um, there was no Afrikaans um, protest music. There was a lot of protest music in Zulu or in Kosa or in, or in, in English, um, but nothing in Afrikaans. And so with a, a, a group of friends, we formed a band called Quiz. Um, and Quiz, for those of you who don't know, is a very generic um, name that you, that in South Africa. So basically, every time you would tell a joke about some absolutely stupid guy, his name is Quiz. Um, and Quiz is actually, in fact, short for Jacobus, which was the, the name of my father and the name I was supposed to have. Jacobus becomes Quiz, and my father was Quiz. So it's really a joke of the, the idiot, the Afrikaans idiot. Um, and we sang anti-apartheid protest songs with a punk um, spirit. So it was, you know, very raw, very brutal, um, taking protest poetry and putting it to music. Um, and, and it was important because it also, the band, um, you know, set, set ignited a, a cultural movement, which then following that, then there was a few other groups who would arrive. And then Afrikaans became a medium of protest songs and a medium of challenging um, the apartheid government. Um, and then unfortunately, I, you know, I went into exile in 1989. Um, and then when I came back, we, we, we played very, very briefly. And then unfortunately one member of the group um, died um, in, in, in committed suicide. So that was the end of course, but it marked time in the, with, with a certain spirit of um, punk protest. Um, and subsequently to that, there's always at some point in my life, I've been involved with, I mean, more recently, I was working with a band from Belgium called Front 242. Um, I've worked with a performance projects, uh, dancers, musicians. I like to bring different traditions together, different disciplines together in order to get a, a multidimensional idea of art and creation, which is closer to, you know, when you, you know, I always think art should be like, 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 like having a meal. Um, you know, when you have a meal, you don't want to just have one thing. You want to have, you know, your vegetables and your, you know, your, your different kinds of food with different flavors and a, and a starter and a main course and a dessert. And of course, a glass of wine to round it off. And so, you know, life should be like that, multidimensional. And the experience of art should also be something which is more than more than being reductive, uh, more than being over specialized, but something that's generous, generous in spirit, generous in form, um, generous enough to be able to evolve with time um, and continue to to inspire people of different generations. Well, um, indeed, your work is uh, very polymorphic, we could say, uh, as you've mentioned, you do not only paint or well, do sculptures, but you also perform, you install ephemeral creations, and you even use digital and technology, uh, technological means to create. Um, do you, well, however, even though you said that you liked uh, mixing up all this kind of art, um, do you have a favorite medium? And <laughs> how do you decide um, to use one technique or another for a specific uh, piece of art? It's my my, my creative process is 
connected not by the material that you see, but by the embodiment of expression. Um, and simply put, I think that the best way to describe what I do is that balance between chaos and order, the balance between what's in my control and what's beyond my control. And the reason why is because what's in my control is predetermined by my education, what I've taught myself, what I've read, what I've learned, what I've seen, what I've experienced, what I've witnessed, um, what, I, what I believe to be right, what I believe to be correct, what I believe to be the best way to make a work of art, um, et cetera, et cetera. And on the other side, chaos, which is things I cannot control. Now, from one point of view, you, we can imagine chaos as being disorderly or, 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 or non, nonsensical or um, unimportant um, and, and, and without um, any value. But on the other side, if we imagine that the, the, the nature of the universe is structured in ways which, where there is no such thing as chaos, there will always be a logic which is perhaps beyond our ability to understand but it's a logic nonetheless you know the the pattern of rain the pattern of the the the, the wind the the, the 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 seasons the tides you know if you if you're on the beach and the waves are coming in they might seem like um chaos however if you map out those 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 waves over the course of a year you will realize how the waves are connected to the seasons which is connected to the moon um, so it, it's that idea of chaos then is me surrendering my ego um, to be able to open up to thing to participate and be in dialogue with things which are greater than me. Um, if one thinks about it from a spiritual point of view, it would be to be listening to the, the songs of angels or listening to the, the, the spirits calling us. Um, if it's quantum physics, it's what we would call quantum entanglement. The idea that things are simultaneously happening in the past and the future at the same time, and that there is some kind of mathematical logic to the universe beyond our ability to comprehend. And so it's important that the work is caught between what I can control and what I can't control. Um, and in painting, a very good example is you splash paint. And what happens is that the, the splash of the paint leaves a, a charge. Um, from another point of view, you can read the momentum of the splash in the way the, the, the paint is contained on, on, on the surface. And from another point of view, you know, one could even read the, the future in the way they, that one le would read tea leaves, or one could read the psychology like, like a Rorschach test from the same splash of paint. So there's more information there than, than simply chaos. Um, on a sculpture point of view, I love to work, for instance, in Place of Paris, because Place of Paris, it starts out as a powder, you mix it with water. It's as ancient as the Egyptians. And it's this liquid that is slipping between my fingers. If I drop it on the floor, it becomes a splash. If I hold it for long enough, it'll take the shape of my hand. If I put it into a mold, it'll take the shape of the mold. And, and in that way, it has infinite potential. And then the dialogue is created between whether it's the painter, whether it's the plaster, my body interacting with these very liquid materials and then listening to what the materials want to tell me. Almost in a sense, I often imagine the canvas already has an image. I can't see the image. And my task is to try to bring this image to the surface, to, to be the midwife in the creation process. Um, and I mean, I love making, working with plaster. I love working with music. I love working with paint. I can't say that I have a particularly um, medium which, I'm, which I favor over any other. Um, although from time to time, it would depend on the, this, my mood. It would depend on uh, my, my, the, the, the world was going on around me. So during the last, um, during the, 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 the numerous um, COVID lockdowns, I found myself increasingly, for instance, working with words. So I've been writing poetry. I've been trying to finish a book that I've been working on for a long time. Um, and I'm finding words to be a very um, useful way of expressing myself because the, the paint or the, or the plaster doesn't seem to make sense right now in lockdown.
Hello? Oh, yeah. Are um, you? <laughs> we are here. As a committed and provocative artist, if I may say so, <laughs> your most famous and striking trademark is the use of the word fuck yes. painting on different surfaces. Yes. On your cadaver exquis, the typhonic base, and even on your own face. Why did you choose to use this pattern as your signature? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so I mean, the cadaver ski is a is a is a wonderful example um, to to speak about because, in fact, the cadaver ski was a surrealist game and a Dada game, and it speaks directly to what I was speaking about earlier. Um, and the cadaver ski, what, what 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 would happen is one artist would draw a head on a piece of paper and fold it. And then the next person would draw the shoulders and then fold it. The next person would draw the, the belly, fold it. The next person would draw the legs. And then you open it up and you have this chimera, which is made up of four different people's interpretation of what the beast could be. Um, and there you have the idea of chaos and control. And you have the idea of a community where the people together are creating an image that's impossible to be created by one person. So the, the cadaver ski that you, that you referred to of my work um, is the Nike do Samothras. And there I was thinking about how the same image in its historical location would have a different meaning than that sa exact same sculpture in the Louvre, which would have an exactly different meaning than when it's covered in blue by Yves Klein or when, when, I, interp when I make my own interpretation. So in a way we have the, I'm a participant in history as well as a victim of history. And how do we try to, um, in, in a logic of, a, of, a, of an exquisite corpse, bring it back to life again, resuscitate um, dead histories in order to breathe life into them? And so whilst I'm absolutely not a fan of provocation, um, I veer away from provocation, it does tend to haunt a lot of what I do because a lot of people find what I do to be provocative. I don't think it is. Um, but also remember that in English, we talk about the shock value of, of things. Um, there is a value in shock. And it's a bit like when, you know, when we speak about the exquisite corpse, the cadaver, which, is, which, which, is, which has lost its life force, it needs electrical shock to bring it back to life again. It needs the shock of to be reanimated, to be brought back to, to something which, which is um, part of our... Our, our, our world. Um, and I use the example very often of when we're ill, we get a fever, which is always unpleasant, but the body heals by raising the temperature. The body heals by being uncomfortable. The body heals by raising the temperature to just, just beneath um, what is necessary to sustain us in order to heat the body up to destroy whatever it is that's making us ill. Um, and art needs to do the same because art can't be entirely passive. Art needs to be active. It needs to be shaking the tree. It needs to be um, challenging us um, in intelligent ways. And yeah, so a lot of people think that um, because I've worked a lot with the word fuck, that it's um, shock, shocking or controversial. I don't see it in that way at all. Although I do certainly use the word fuck because it is does have a value um, and it has a value because um, I, since I love words, since I'm fascinated by the power of words, um, the word fuck is a word that still today can make people angry. It's still a today, it's a word that creates an emotion. It makes people upset. Um, and there's very, you know, love doesn't make you upset anymore. Revolution doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean anything anymore. Revolution is a perfume. Um, Anarchist is a perfume. Um, you know, um, whereas fuck is not yet a perfume. I'm sure it will be shortly. Um, and the thing about fuck is that what, what makes it such a powerful word is because the way you use the word changes the meaning completely. So if I say fuck you to somebody, it's an an act of aggression, it's a declaration of war, and it's likely to lead to very, you know, brutal consequences. If I say, fuck you, I'm going to end up having a, a fight with somebody. Whereas if I use the exact same word and I say, fuck me, it's an invitation. 
fuck me is very positive. It's a very beautiful, it's, a, it's an act of love. And don't forget that to fuck at the end of the day is to make love. It only becomes pejorative by the way it gets used. So how do we take fuck and return it to making love and return it to the love that's in revolution when you write it backwards? Using the word fuck in order to um, raise our temperatures, use the shock value in order to restore value to meaning and meaning to words, um, to make them to make them be efficient again in 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 a in a in poetry in the sense of Rambo's poetry, you know, a strong provocation can can open our minds, can open our perceptions, can 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 literally lead the way to transformation of self or of the world that we're living in. Well, this is uh, super, super interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to follow up a little bit on the revolution, uh, revolutionary aspect, the revolutionary dimension of your art, uh, even though you just said that revolution is more of a perfume now than it was before, but still. Um, in the material you used, the conception of and the meaning of your art, uh, of your art pieces, um, everything is very revolutionary. And what will you say is the most revolutionary piece you have made ah. and why? <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to say, um, to quantify that. That is something which history will determine. Um, but I guess, you know, I, I, yeah, it's very hard to say, uh, but perhaps the most revolutionary work was, um, is, uh, my self-portrait, which is a broken bottle of Heineken beer. Um, because it's a work which haunts in, in, in the way that um, it's absolutely as an object worthless. Um, you can walk outside any shopping center or supermarket or bar, or in fact, you can walk just about anywhere in the world and you'll find a little broken bottle of beer somewhere. Um, it is useless because it cannot be used for anything. It's too small to be recycled. It's too small to be upcycled. Um, and in fact, its only real function would be to use it as a weapon. Um, you could use the broken glass on the top of a, of a wall to make a very archaic form of security, or you could uh, literally stab somebody with um, the broken bottle. But apart from that, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a function. It doesn't have a value. And so to assign that as my um, self-portrait is an extremely revolutionary, provocative um, decision because it reduces me to the level of garbage. Um, but I like the, 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 the other word for garbage in English, which is refuse, refuse because refuse is also refuse. And the self-portrait refuses to accept the refuse of my identity. Um, because it's a green bottle and it, it still has its label. And the biggest letters on the label says imported in big red letters, imported. And then underneath is small from Holland, which is what I am. Um, a white Afrikaans South African is a import from the Netherlands going back 300 years. Um, and then it says Heineken, the superior quality. Now, a lot of people then, you know, when I travel, they give me a bottle of Heineken beer. And it's like, well, why would you do that? And I thought, oh, because I thought you like Heineken. No, I, I actually hate the beer. You know, it's also, it's not a positive self-image, the self-portrait. It's about, it's an image of self-loathing. It is not something which is comfortable. And I think the, the, the radical nature of that object is to transform something of absolutely no value, to speak about the contradictions and the complexities of my, my, my identity. Um, and the, 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 the struggle that I have with determining who and what I am. Um, and is that, that absolute shift from taking garbage and transforming it into, into something which has value and importance. Well, thank you very much for this explanation. Uh, you you... Early... Yes. You early mentioned your recent interest for poetry that you found during the lockdown due to the COVID-19. Could you tell us a little bit more about this new way of creating and sharing your passion for art? Sure. Well, it's my relationship with poetry goes back all the way to the very beginning. Um, 
because when I came back from exile in 1990, um, there was a very important essay that was written by L.B. Sachs called Preparing Ourselves for Freedom. And in this essay, what L.B. Sachs said is that now that apartheid is over and Mandela's released, um, we need to change the way we understand the role and function of art. And what he was referring to was um, in, during apartheid, we used to say um, that uh, the, the culture is a weapon of the struggle. We used to say that we need to use our talents as artists or cultural workers in order to um, facilitate the, the opposition to apartheid, the struggle against um, the fascism. And he said that it's time now, when Mandela is released, to um, stop saying that culture is a weapon of the struggle and now to make art for art's sake, to make beautiful art, to return to the idea of poetry and aesthetics and, and, and you know, painting, beauty, beautiful, beautiful things. And I, I more or less launched my, my career with, a, with a, an essay I wrote in which I, 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 I protested. I said, no, I don't agree with you because, and I was recalling the, um, the, the, the text of Adorno when he said that after Auschwitz, there can be no poetry. And for me, after everything I had experienced in the anti-apartheid struggle um, was that after apartheid, there can be no poetry. The experience of apartheid had been so brutal that I felt that any form of beauty or poetry would be an escape of responsibility, an escape of culpability. It, is, it, would, it would make it too easy for people to change their spots and suddenly um, get away with the crimes against humanity. I, was, I felt that we needed um, to be challenged. Um, and at the same time, I, I felt that this was an opportunity to redefine our understanding of art. And so what I said is, okay, instead of art for art's sake, and instead of culture being a weapon of the struggle, let's now make the struggle a weapon of art. So that goes straight back to the idea of May 68. So let's take the revolution and let the, the, the revolution inform our practice as artists. Um, and for many years, the work was very much about borders and, and abuse of power and, and hierarchical structures. Um, and I always, it's also important that um, I always protested and resisted against the idea of calling my work political um, because I hate the, the, the title of political art because it doesn't have any transform, transformative um, effect. It doesn't change anything in the sense that if I stand up and announce to you who I voted for, or which political party I believe in, or whether I'm capitalist or communist, um, what am I doing? I'm simply announcing my politics. And then you would have basically two choices. You agree with me or you disagree with me. Um, but if you agree with me, I'm, I'm speaking to the converted. And if you disagree with me, well, nothing, nothing happens. So for me, that kind of political art is, is, is stillborn. Um, I don't even think of it as art. I mean, it's just pure propaganda. Um, and it's arrogant in the sense that why would any artist assume that their politics is better than anybody else's politics? Um, in announcing your politics from a moral high ground, how are you any different than the, the missionaries who went through Africa um, and used religion to destroy um, the faith of a continent? Political, political art for me is in the sense of creating, and this was this idea of no poetry after apartheid, where I would use my experiences to construct morally ambiguous situations. Um, i give you an example, a room full of body bags that are all open and empty, um, a room full of um, um, security fencing, um, which is like with a, with a razor, razor mesh fencing. Um, so you go into these or a room full of broken glass um, protruding out of um, concrete walls in, in, in the darkness. Um, these are morally ambiguous um, uh, situations. A, a good example is um, a the typhonic beast that you mentioned in your questions um, where I take a blue whale skull and I spray paint it with my fuck pattern. Um, so these are moral ambiguities that invites the viewer then with a sense of generosity to build, I build a bridge 
to invite the viewer to, instead of me telling you what do I believe in, instead of telling you what my politics is, I invite the viewer to contemplate their own politics. The moral ambiguity of the situation, of the image, or the or the or the song, or the or the installation, is what people find the shock, the shocking aspect of my work. Invites you to decide for yourself where do you stand. And there, what happens is that well, then you can choose to either change your mind or agree with yourself. But either way, it's a, it's an active process where you your own politics is engaged, and and you um, have to decide what you know. Where do you stand on on the on the um, when 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 at the end of the day on the 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 edge of the the razor blade? And as years went by, you know, I you know I was always a fan of poetry, but I never understood so well the political function of poetry until during the lockdown I spent a lot of time reading Rambo, and I got to understand Rambo differently, um, and I got to understand the the the, the and perhaps. I reached a point where my French was 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 good enough to be able to read Rambo and have a, a deeper appreciation. Um, and Rambo really inspired me because it is it is personal and political at the same time. He's challenging language, he's challenging history, and he's also challenging the way the artist functions. You know, in, his, in the letter when he speaks about the derangement of the senses, where he needs to lose himself in order to give birth to what it is to be a poet. And that, you know, that it's that form of poetry that then more recently began to inspire me and um, and that informs my 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 work. Um, and I made a beautiful painting which was a, a homage to Rambo, which says, see, it's the word seasons in hell, but when you break it down, it becomes see, sin, uh, no, see, sin, see, sun, see, sun, sin, hell. I can send you an image of it. Well, we are reaching the end of this very, very inspiring conversation. And I want to ask you one last question. Since we are addressing the African youth, mm -hmm. what would you like to tell them today? What advice can you give them today regarding your own experience? Ah, <laughs> this, is a, this is a lovely question. Um, you know, I, I was speaking yesterday to a friend of mine um, and a lot, and he was saying that um, a lot of young people in Africa today want to turn away from the African systems, um, African heritage, and they want to embrace modernity. They want to be the same as anybody in London, Paris or New York um, or, 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 or Shanghai or Tokyo. And they want to have smartphones and computers and be part of a digital revolution, a digital age. Um, and I think that that is the wrong way to go because like that, we all become um, Google, Googleists. We lose our identity. We become the same as any, everybody else. We, we use the same filters, the same apps, the same, the same um, programs to make the same kinds of music. Um, and in that way, we all become essentially um, part of a Silicon Valley. Um, and I think that, that, that's, that there's, there's merit to that. But I don't believe that this should be the path for Africa. The, the, the problem of Africa is that the history of the continent was written by the invaders. Um, and the history is told from the point of view of the, the colonialists. But there, is, there are vast bodies of knowledge and archives and knowledge systems in Africa, which is so much more richer, so much more, more, more fruitful than anything that Silicon Valley can, can, can offer us. And I think that for, you know, I, my advice for any young person in Africa today is learn your history of your own country, of your own continent, of your own village. And, you know, a lot of people might be surprised, for instance, in the, to, to discover that in the 15th century, before Columbus set sail for the Americas, the Portuguese and the Dutch would sail to the Congo and they would bow down to the Congo king with the same um, reverence that they would bow down to the Pope at the day. The Congo king was wealthy, was respected, and was, was, was the Congo kingdom had um, ambassadors to 
Brazil, to the Netherlands, to Portugal and the Vatican. Um, you know, learn those histories about our own continent um, and, 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 from, and with your roots in knowledge, in history, then find ways of creating different kinds of fruits, which is, which is African in, in its nature, which is not trying to become um, a European fantasy or an American fantasy or a global fantasy of Africa, but rather Africa, which is rooted in itself. And, and I, again, I mean, it's important to say that Africa is a continent of 54 countries. It is not something that can be reduced to anything singular. But if one takes the time to learn one's own history of one's own culture, I think there's a great wealth here that needs to be preserved because if we don't in this generation now preserve the history of the continent, it will eventually get lost forever. Well, thank you so much for your time and well, this very inspiring and great discussion. Um, it was very like full of experience sharing and wonderful advice for all our, our audience. Um, we were, well, I would like to say that we were very, very honored to have you as our guest today for the Share Africa interviews. And, um, well, we thank you very much for your time and your dedication. Thank you very much.